Hello and welcome to the History Network dot org podcast, season twenty three, episode seven: The Battle of the Medak Pocket, September nineteen ninety three. This episode was written by David Boris. David Boris is a Canadian military historian from Langara College and the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. He is also the host of the popular Canadian podcast, Cool Canadian History. You can find David on Twitter by using the handle at Doc Boris, that's D-O-C-B-O-R-Y-S. And you can find his podcast by searching any of your podcast platforms by searching Cool Canadian History. Introduction. The Battle of the Medak Pocket in the autumn of 1993 was, up to that point, the biggest military engagement participated in by Canadian soldiers since the Korean War. Though it was an almost day-long battle against Croatian forces bent on ethnic cleansing, it was covered up by the Canadian government and still remains one of the least known episodes in Canadian military history. To understand the background to the Battle of the Medak Pocket, we must first go back to the end of the Second World War, when the country of Yugoslavia was formed with its leader, Marshal Josip Tito. Tito ruled over a federation of six provincial republics that were loosely based along ethnic and historical lines – Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Slovenia, Bosnia-Herzegovina and Macedonia. Yet these provinces were in no way homogenous entities and a variety of religious, linguistic, cultural and ethnic groups existed within them. Slovenians, Croatians, Serbians, Kosovars, Albanians were some of the largest ethnic groups, but many regions also held a mix of Christian and Muslim groups. Often these various groups lived side by side in the various towns, villages, neighbourhoods and cities of the new Yugoslavian state. Under the fairly strict and autocratic rule of Marshal Tito, these various ethnic groups seemed to get along well enough, at the least on the surface. During Tito's multi-decade reign, very few instances of widespread hostilities between the various groups appeared. However, this would all change when Tito died in 1980. After Tito's death, the federal political system began to fall apart as nationalist groups representing the variety of ethnic peoples within Yugoslavia began clamouring for various forms of independence from the Yugoslavian state. Serbia, as the strongest of the republics, began to try to take control of the crumbling state. By 1990, however, a number of nationalist and ethnic-based independence movements had come to power in their various regions. The rise to political power of these nationalist groups set the stage for a complete breaking apart of the former Yugoslavia. Croatia formally broke away and announced its independence in June 1991, yet a large number of Croatians still lived in the territory of the former Yugoslavia that was controlled by the Serbians. Croatians in Croatia and those in what would become the nation of Serbia were concerned over the fate of this minority Croatian group living amongst a majority Serbian population. At the same time, a minority Serbian population lived in the new state of Croatia. Both Croatian and Serbian minority populations began to arm themselves and form paramilitary groups. This inter-ethnic tension eventually erupted into all-out war. By the summer of 1991, fighting had broken out in what would become a decade of continual conflict engulfing all of the former Yugoslavia, now often referred to by historians as the Third Balkan War or the Yugoslavian Wars. This is the background to the situation that faced world leaders in the early 1990s. By 1992 particularly, disturbing reports by the media and by survivors were accusing both sides of committing acts of ethnic cleansing. This could take the form of forcibly removing people from their land through intimidation and violence, or in other cases murdering scores of civilians. 
Within the context of the Croatian-Serbian struggle, both sides were guilty of war crimes, though the Western media began to foster the narrative that it was Serbian paramilitaries ethnically cleansing Croatian populations. Immense public pressure was being applied to world leaders to step in and stop the brutal conflict. For many Canadians, the country's legacy of peacekeeping resonated strongly amongst the calls for global intervention. Many Canadians optimistically and enthusiastically supported Canadian involvement in a UN peacekeeping mission to help end the conflict in the broken and shattered Yugoslavia. While the media portrayed a fairly simplistic and at times one-sided version of the conflict, the Canadians that arrived in Yugoslavia would find state militaries, paramilitaries and non-sanctioned militia fighting each other in a complex and convoluted arena full of ethnic, linguistic, territorial and religious rivalry. Once on the ground, many soldiers realised that both sides of the conflict were committing horrific acts against each other's civilian populations. By January of 1992, Serbian forces now fighting for the New Republic of Serbia and Croatian forces fighting for the Croatian state had reached a fragile ceasefire. Large chunks of southern Croatian territory, however, were still held by Serbian forces. The ceasefire was thus used by the Croatian military to reinforce and resupply their troops along the border in preparation for another offensive. To ensure that no more fighting would occur, the United Nations sent in a United Nations Protection Force, UN Profor, to keep the two sides apart, while negotiations for a permanent peace could be hammered out. This uneasy peace was not to last. In the fall of 1993, Croatian forces launched an offensive to recapture their lost territory. By mid-September, the Croatians had pushed far into Serbian-held territory and neared the small town of Medak. One of the most effective and respected units in all of the former Yugoslavia were the soldiers of UN Profor's Canadian Battalion 1, Kanbat 1, made up of the men of 2nd Battalion Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, PPCLI, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel James Calvin. Interestingly, out of the 875 soldiers making up 2 PPCLI, nearly half were Canadian reservists who had volunteered to serve from various militia units across the country. These part-time soldiers, along with full-time members of the PPCLI, would soon be tested. On the 15th of September, the two PPCLI, along with two French mechanised units, were ordered to interject themselves in between the advancing Croatians and the defending Serbians. The Franco-Canadian force planned to first occupy the Serbian front lines along a valley floor before moving up from the valley into the Croatian front lines to secure the Croatian withdrawal. Relations between the UN forces and the Croatians was already quite poor as UN troops had been fired upon by Croatian soldiers earlier that year and were in fact forced to pull back from a strategically important position near Peruka Lake. Thus, Calvin was concerned that the Croatians would attempt to once again use force to prevent the UN troops from achieving their objectives. These fears would prove correct. The Canadians were well equipped for battle. Riflemen carried their standard-issue C7 automatic rifles, as well as a number of C9 light machine guns and C6 medium machine guns. The rifle companies travelled in M1113 armoured personnel carriers, APCs, each mounted with a powerful Browning .50 calibre machine gun. The companies were also carrying with them several 84mm Carl Gustav anti-tank rocket launchers. Their French allies travelled in VAB infantry fighting vehicles mounted with a deadly and accurate 20mm auto cannon. The Franco-Canadian force was placing themselves in front of the Lico Wolves Guards Brigade, who could not match the Canadians in terms of small arms firepower, but were well supported with artillery and tanks, including a squadron of Warsaw-packed T-72s. On the 15th of September, the M1113s of Canbat 1 
rolled forward towards their designated positions. Almost immediately a full-blown firefight erupted. Croatian rocket-propelled grenades, heavy machine gun and 20mm anti-aircraft fire forced both the Canadians and French to dig in roughly along the old Serbian front line mortar and artillery fire from the croatians intensified into the night several attempts by the croatians to outflank the franco-canadian positions were repulsed colonel calvin writes about this part of the battle at twelve hundred hours our two companies charlie company on the left and one of the french companies on the right started moving forward past the serb tanks and infantry and into the zone between the two front lines this area between the two front lines varied. Sometimes they were 400 metres apart, sometimes 1,200 metres apart. But you can appreciate that if each side had now taken the point of terrain that was the most tactically sound to defend, the terrain that was in between them was what we normally refer to as a killing zone. And that was the area into which we were moving the Canadians and the French. When we passed by the Serb front lines, we started being fired on by the Croatians. Initially it was one round, two rounds. We honestly thought it was a mistake, and we gave direction to put bigger UN flags on our antennas and make sure the white vehicles were prevalent, so that they would know who was moving into the no-man's land between the two front lines. When we did that, they started firing machine guns at us instead of single rounds, and it became evident that this was not an accident, but actually a concentrated attempt to fire at the United Nations. The Canadian and the French soldiers started taking the normal actions when you're fired on. They started responding in kind, and for the next 15 hours between roughly 1pm and 8.30 the following morning, the Canadians and the French were in what was basically a combat situation with the Croatian army at ranges of 150 to 800 metres. Interestingly, the Croatians chose not to employ their T-72s. Perhaps knowledge of the Canadian anti-tank weaponry was enough to prevent the Croatians from risking their valuable armour. For nearly 18 hours, the Franco-Canadian force exchanged fire with the Croatians, who continually attempted to advance upon the UN position. The fire from the French 20mm guns became crucial in neutralising Croatian heavy artillery, while the PPCLI small arms fire kept most of the Croatian soldiers at bay. By the early morning of the 16th of September, the Croatian commander realised he could not force the position and agreed to a ceasefire and a withdrawal by noon that day. 27 Croat soldiers were killed or wounded, while the Franco-Canadian force suffered four wounded. Yet the Patricias arose to a terrible sight on that morning of the 16th of September. Smoke could be seen rising from several villages behind Croatian lines, while the odd explosion and burst of semi-automatic machine gun fire could be heard. The fighting had stopped, yet the Croatians seemed to be still using their weapons. Very quickly it became clear that to the Canadians that the Croatians were carrying out ethnic cleansing on the Serbian villages behind Croatian lines. What happened next was a fascinating commentary on the nature of modern warfare. The Croatians did not, in fact, withdraw as their commander had originally agreed, and instead remained in their positions, while Colonel Calvin clamoured for action. Instead of fighting his way through the Croatian lines, he decided to use a new tactic to force the Croatians into a move. He boldly walked up to a heavily defended Croatian roadblock, followed by some of his soldiers, and scores of international reporters. Once he arrived at the roadblock, he held an impromptu press conference. He told the reporters why the Canadians were not being allowed to move forward, and what was going on behind the Croatian lines. A public affairs nightmare was now brewing for the Croatian commander, and on the 17th of September, the Croatian force withdrew. Discoveries in the aftermath of the battle would prove horrific. There was significant evidence that the Croatian military had conducted ethnic cleansing in the region of Medak. Scores of Serbian civilian bodies were discovered in the woods, including a mass grave of fifty bodies. The bodies of two young women were found in a basement. They had apparently been tied up, shot, and then doused with gasoline and burnt. An elderly Serbian woman was found executed 
with four shots to her head. The whereabouts of the remaining civilian population was unknown, though the ground was littered with surgical gloves, indicating that a number of bodies had been removed from the area. To this day the region remains sparsely populated. Several members of the Croatian military were later charged with war crimes by the International Crime Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The two most prominent Croatians accused were Mirko Norak, commander of the Croatian Medak operation, and Rahim Ademi, Norak's superior officer. Norak was found guilty of war crimes, but a Croatian court commuted his sentence to one year. Ademi was acquitted. Interestingly, for many years the Canadian government denied the battle ever took place, and the Battle of the Medak has often been referred to as Canada's secret battle. At the time, many in the Canadian government felt that public knowledge of Canadian peacekeepers engaged in actual combat would be harmful to public opinion and support for continued Canadian involvement in the UN mission. As well, an emerging Canadian peacekeeping scandal in Somalia led to further calls to ensure the Medak battle was forgotten. It was only in the early 2000s that bits and pieces of the battle finally began to emerge. In 2002, the 2nd Battalion, PPCLI, received the Commander-in-Chief Unit Citation for their work at Medak, the first of its kind to ever be awarded. The Croatian government denies the battle ever took place. Thanks so much for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast, written by David Boris, read by Nick Barker. Mm-hmm.